Is Billy Napier's job safe or is he indeed on the hot seat for the 2024 season? You are Locked On Gators, your daily podcast on the Florida Gators. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Walk with me. Hello and welcome back to another episode of Locked On Gators, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thanks for making Locked On Gators your first listen of the day. Every day we are available daily and free. Reviews to the podcast and on YouTube. Happy Friday. I'm Brandon Olson. Find me on Twitter at WNS underscore Brandon. Find all my written work with Giants, Country, and NFL 33. Today's episode of Locked On Gators is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On College for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms do apply. Also, Florida Gators Dynasty coming out today on Whole Nine Sports W H O L E N I N E Sports YouTube page. We got episode two, game two. It's against Samford, uh, but. At SEC Media Days, which were this week, the Florida Gators spoke on Wednesday. I will say this. I do think that Billy Napier, he kind of just talked like he was more confident than usual, which I really like. Um, but at SEC Media Days, Billy Napier said that he believes they're on schedule. In, as far as rebuilding the program, bringing the Florida Gators back, uh, he, he believes that they are on schedule with what they inherited. Do, do with that information what you will. But Napier has said, hey, we're on schedule with what we've inherited. If you go back to, it was late January, uh, Scott Strickland kind of got caught up at a basketball game and, and people asked him questions. I think it was on three. And he was pretty adamant that, hey, we're on schedule. Billy Napier just needs time to succeed. And there's a couple of things about that here. One, I don't think... No matter how many times you ask the question, I don't think you're ever going to get Billy Napier to go, yeah, I'm on the hot seat right now. Um, just because, especially in college football, that's never going to pan out that way. Like, that's never going to pan out that well, to go, yeah, I'm on the hot seat. Because if you think about it from Billy Napier's perspective, he can never admit that he's on the hot seat, whether or not he is. He can never admit that he's on the hot seat. Because if he admits that he's on the hot seat, Recruiting's already going not great, right? If he goes, yeah, I'm on the hot seat outright. I need to win at least this many games in order to keep my job. No recruits are going to commit for him. Like it, it's as it's as simple as that. As far as why he can never admit that he's on the hot seat, whether or not he is, he could be like he could have someone in his ear right now, just like, hey, if you don't win seven games, you're fired. If you don't win six games, you're fired. If you don't win eight games, you're fired. Whatever it may be. He could have someone in his ear right now saying that. But realistically, Billy Napier can never publicly admit that. Is Florida on schedule with what they inherited? I don't think so. Honestly, I don't think so. I think that season, like year one in 2022, I think they might have slightly overperformed in some areas. Uh, but I do think that also 2023, they underperformed in more areas, specifically the entire defense. I don't think that they're on schedule with what they inherited. I think they're slightly behind. And I will say slightly behind schedule. I don't think that they're drastically behind, slightly behind schedule, as far as strictly where the team is. Slightly behind schedule. Billy Napier, again, will never admit that he is on the hot seat. Uh, as far as what Scott Strickland said back in January about being adamant that Billy Napier needs time to succeed, Scott Strickland will never in his life say that Billy Napier is on the hot seat. Okay? And yes, Scott Strickland's the athletic director. He's a peg higher than Billy Napier. But here's the thing. Scott Strickland will not get to say that Billy Napier is on the hot seat. He will never say that because if he admits that, like, he's tied to Billy Napier. He is. I firmly believe that. If Billy Napier gets fired, Scott Strickland will get, will get fired. I, I firmly believe that. I don't, I don't think Scott Strickland gets to make that decision. So I, I will say that, and by that, by Scott Strickland doesn't get to make the decision, I mean that you're both gone, and that'll be the approach. Uh, so I, I will say that, yeah, even if it is true, I, I, I don't think that they will ever really admit it. 
Uh, and the fact of the matter is that his resume to this point at Florida is 11 and 14 wins. He had the number 13th ranked high school class in 2024, where for most of the season they were top 10. And another fact, his buyout is going to suck no matter what. If he ever gets fired, his buyout is going to suck. Just know that. Because of Billy Napier's buyout, it being that Billy Napier is fired at any point without cause, very important distinction, without cause, he is paid 85% of his remaining contract value. 85%. Which means that every year, it's not like there's a big drop-off between how much money you would have spent if you keep Billy Napier or fire Billy Napier. Because the fact is that Billy Napier, at the absolute minimum, will be paid 85% of that total contract value if he's fired without cause. He could get fired right now and he would have made, what, 88% of his total contract value, something along those lines. You are, at minimum, even if you hired Billy Napier, fired him the next day, you're paying 85% of that contract. And so every year... As we go, it's like, yeah, you're, you're kind of shaving maybe a mil, maybe two off the total value of keeping him that entire time. But his buyout's going to suck because, Str frankly, Scott Strickland got demolished. Absolutely demolished by Billy Napier's agent, okay? It, it's as simple as that. When you talk about the contract negotiation absolutely demolished there's just no other way to put it um and, and yeah that that kind of is what it is we we kind of expect that at this point and yeah we, we have to kind of just go through this and say all right now what do we do at this point because that that's how things work but that that's what it is with billy napier's contract value but again is he really on the hot seat I think so. I think he's genuinely on the hot seat. And I understand that me saying that means that there's going to be some of you in the comment section. Don't say that. Recruits are going to see this. I will say this. I am confident in my opinion on things. I'm confident in my football IQ. I'm confident in all that stuff. I don't think recruits should necessarily be, be listening to a podcast and going, that's impacting my decision. I don't, I don't think that should be the case. Um, I, I will throw that out there because I know I'm going to get the comment of, of don't talk about that. Recruits are going to see this. If they do, they shouldn't take it in, into their consideration of their final school. But now, now that we've got, I think Billy Napier's on the hot seat. Got that out the way. Now we go, what does Billy Napier need to do or what should Billy Napier need to do in order to keep his job in 2024 and beyond. Game time is an authorized ticket marketplace of Major League Baseball, which makes getting tickets faster and easier now that baseball is back after the All-Star break comes back today. Prices on Game Time app actually go down the closer that you get to first pitch with killer last-minute deals, all in prices, so there's no surprise fees coming at you. Views from your seat. So in the app, you can click on a ticket and you can see the view that you will have during that game or, or concert or wherever you may be. You can click on a seat. I'll click on a random seat from the Florida versus Miami game. That's that's the view that you'd have right there. Right there. That's it. it it's looking a little screwy because it augment. It's like it, it shifts with how I move my phone. But that's the view that you would have uh, at, at the game if you bought those tickets and the lowest price guarantee so that if you find tickets in the same section and a row for less game time will give you 110 percent of the difference so game time takes the guesswork out of buying mlb nfl college football any kinds of tickets take the guesswork out of buying it download game time today create an account use code locked on college for 20 dollars off your first purchase term supply again create an account redeem code locked on college for 20 dollars off download game time today last minute tickets lowest price guaranteed Thanks for making Locked On Gators your first listen of the day. Every day we are available daily and free wherever you listen to podcasts and on YouTube. 
And now we talk about what Billy Napier needs to do or what he should have to do, what should be the expectations for keeping his job. And I asked the Lockdown Gators insiders, which if you want to be a, an insider, if you want to join the insider program, the link's in the description below. If you want to join that, you can contribute to things like this. There's also the Lockdown Gators Discord. Link's in the description below, whether you're on YouTube or audio. Both those links are there, okay? And I asked people their opinions of, hey, what do you think Billy Napier needs to do to keep his job? Or, or what do you think Billy Napier needs to do for you to be comfortable with him keeping his job? And the based on all the answers, I took the basic expectation seven wins that that that's what it was there were some people that said six there were some people that said eight there was even a couple that said nine and i think one person said five but most people said seven and then of course you kind of standard deviation the the five through nines and we're going to get to seven but most people said seven wins most people said seven wins is what they need for billy napier to keep his job and they also paired it with the recruiting class which we'll talk about afterward uh, but looking at the schedule for the Florida Gators, I think you could break down into a couple of ways in which Florida should pick up seven wins. Okay. Breaking it down just by the legs, Miami, Samford, Texas, and Mississippi State. Personally, in my opinion, you should come out of that three and one at the absolute minimum. Absolute minimum in those first four games, you should win three of them, at least. I think you should win all four, but minimum three. Okay. You've got. Three of those four at home and the one on the road is Mississippi State. You should win at least three of those games. Your next stretch is UCF, Tennessee, Kentucky. You should win at least two of those games. You should beat UCF, especially because you're home, and Kentucky. You're home. It's homecoming. Florida has lost to them three years in a row. Billy Napier has lost to them two years in a row. You should beat Kentucky. Okay? Tennessee, I think that Florida could beat Tennessee. I think that your defense last year was really bad and you boxed Tennessee. However, it's also really tough to go into Neyland and win. Um, and there's that Lido. If you're, if you're watching, uh, you did lose at Neyland last year. I'm just saying, I'm just saying, just saying by four touchdowns. I'm just saying, um, but then, so right now you're at five and two here. Then you've got those last games where I think you should win. I think you can win two of those five. Yeah. I think you lose to Georgia, you lose to Texas. And I think you can win two out of three between LSU, Ole Miss, and Florida State. I've said very openly, I am not sold on LSU yet. I am not sold on Florida State yet. I, they're just two teams. I need to see it. It's as simple as that. Same thing with Miami and Texas a and I don't care how good you tell me those teams are. I need to see it because I'm not sold on what I've seen from last year and who they have on their roster. And the only real evaluation you can make is what you saw last year. And so when I look at who they have on roster and I say, yeah, this is what they did last year. Obviously, situations can change. Guys can develop. Guys can also get worse. It happens every year. So I just need to see it. And, and with Florida, I need to see it. Making that abundantly clear. I'm not only saying that because they're opponents. Uh, but right now, you can win two of those last three. Hey, you can, you can rattle off five straight wins. And then you just got to win two in the final seven games. Easier said than done, of course, but you should beat Kentucky. And then, you know, you, you have to win one of those last five to get to the seven win mark. So I don't think it's unrealistic. When Elijah Badger joined the team, I said that my expectation going into this offseason was that Florida needs to win five or six games, or Florida will win five or six games. That was my prediction, not expectation. Expectations are higher, but that's my prediction. Okay. Uh, and our expectations should be higher. I understand where Florida is as a program right now. They should be higher. It's unacceptable where they are as a program right now. So I will say that, that, yeah, I understand Florida's roster, the schedule, all that stuff. I wish Florida was in a spot where I go, I don't give a damn who's on the roster. Mow them down. I wish Florida was in a spot like that. But realistically, they're just not, in my opinion. But seven wins, I think, is achievable. When, when Elijah Badger joined the team, I was saying, yeah, five and five or six wins. Elijah Badger joined the team, and I said, you know what? I think that this is enough of a bump to say you should win six or seven. If seven's the minimum there, that's, a, I think, a realistic thing. Eight, nine, that's stretching it for me. But seven wins, 
I think that's fair expectations. I'm just going to be completely honest. Like I always say on this show, as long as you know that I'm being honest, that's it. Like you're getting my honest opinion. We're here to educate, inform, entertain, right? Uh, and lying doesn't help two thirds of those. So it, it can entertain. Uh, but yeah, I, I think looking at that schedule again, first four games, I think you should win all four, but at the very minimum, win three. Next three, you should win two of the three. Could win all three. How realistically, or no, I don't want to say realistically, but I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility to go, yeah, they start seven and out. I don't think it's going to happen. I want to make that clear, but it could. You could also break it up into Florida has Miami at home, Sanford at home, Texas A&M at home, UCF at home, Kentucky at home. Uh, then you've got LSU at home, Ole Miss at home. You've got seven home games. You dominate your home turf, you win those seven games. You win six of your seven home games, you have to win one on the road or neutral site. There, there's a very real path to going, hey, seven wins should be the minimum to keep your job. It, I, I, I kind of agree with that. I, and again, I don't think that that's the actual expectation. I think the actual expectation is six wins. And that's not me saying that. I think seven's fair. I think six is internally. They go, yeah, you won six games. As long as the recruiting class is decent, we'll keep you. I think, that, I think that's what you could say internally. But I think that seven wins being the bare minimum is fair. Again, you look at you have six home games. You've got one neutral site. One of your away games is Mississippi State. I think that it's totally fair to go, you should win seven of these games. You've got, like, next year is going to be tougher schedule-wise, I think, because you're going to have more road games. But realistically, and you don't have a Samford next year. You have Florida A&M, who I'm not saying that they're, they're a great team, but they're better than Samford. Florida A&M puts NFL players in there. Montreal Washington is the only Samford player I can name that's in the NFL. Uh, so I do think that it's realistic to say, hey, seven wins, bare minimum. Because if you're not a good enough coach to win seven games, you're probably not going to be a good enough coach to ever win a championship here. Schedule's not going to get much easier. I know we talk about the difficulty of the schedule, whatever it is. This is the SEC that just added Texas and Oklahoma. This is the SEC that may add another team at some point in the future or another two teams at some point in the future. Things aren't getting easier here. They're getting harder because one of the big selling points against Texas or Oklahoma recruiting wise was, hey, you're not playing in the SEC if you're there. Now you get to play with those big dogs in recruiting. Now they're here and they don't have that anymore. Like now that they they've joined the big dogs in recruiting where they get to say, yeah, you could be with Texas, a national brand, one of the biggest brand names out there, one of the biggest powerhouse programs on the planet that is now in the SEC. Things aren't getting easier for Florida. So the expectations should be raised up a little bit because guess what? You need an elite coach and an elite recruiter in order to win games and recruiting right now is a little frustrating. To wrap up today's episode of Locked On Gators, I got fired up there. I'm not going to lie to you. I got a little, my, my blood's boiling right now. Um, but to wrap up today's episode of Locked On Gators, we are talking about the recruiting classes for the Florida Gators, which right now you look at Billy Napier's transition class in 2022. Honestly, for almost every single coach on the planet, I will chalk it for your recruiting class, your your transfer, uh, that transition class. I will chalk it for pretty much any coach in the country. It's just what it is, uh, especially when you get hired late November. You got basically three weeks to turn around a lot of it. Florida had the 17th ranked class overall, 18th composite, uh, 18th transfer, because that transfer class also brought in Ricky Pearsall, Cyrus Torrance, Jalen Kimber, Montreal Johnson, uh, Cam Waits, and Jack Miller, which I don't care how you feel about any of those people. We're talking about their rankings. That's what it is. Then the 2023 class, the bump class for Florida, 12th overall, 13th composite, 16th transfer class. That transfer class had Lindell Hudson, RJ Moten, Keonta Goodwin, Manny Nunnery, Cameron Carroll, uh, Damian George, Micah Mazuka, Deuce Spurlock, Taraja Mitchell, Cam Jackson, Graham Mertz, Kayla Banks. A lot of those, when they came in as transfers, were three stars, a couple of four stars, but most of them three stars. Uh, the four-star transfers were Kayla Banks, Graham Mertz, Cam Jackson, Micah Mazuka, who we know didn't pan out, Deontay Goodwin, who left because of an unfortunate situation with his mother's health, and R.J. Moten, 
for all transfers, RJ Moten's safety at Michigan now a linebacker. I was very high on him coming over. Didn't pan out. But then you look at the 2024 class. And I also want to make this very clear. I asked the same group, and top 10 class is what we pretty much came to. That was the consensus. There were, I think, two people that said top 12. And most people said top 10. We had a couple top fives. But I will say this. I think that you can't fully determine the class rankings until basically after the spring with how insane the portal is, right? Because you look at the Florida Gators 2024 class, and I think it's the exact indictment on you can't look at this until after it's all said and done, until after the spring portal session ends. Because Florida, on early signing day, had the 13th ranked high school class. That's what they finished with. It was 13, or, or the high school class in general after National Signing Day finished 13th in the country. Okay. That was their high school class at signing day, 13th. And I know a lot of people will look at their high school recruiting class and go, yeah, like you have the high school recruiting class, you dip in a little in the portal, but you know, that's not the major part of it. No, no, no. With how insane the portal is right now, with how many kids jump into the portal, with how many young players jump into the portal that are basically an extension of the high school class? You need to look at the high school class combined with the portal class. And I'm not the type where I, I, I want to sit here and I go, oh, you can't use the portal heavy. Like you can't have the, the 12th ranked high school class and the top portal class. I'm, I'm not that type because I think that a lot of the other thing that most of it needs context. Do you have the top portal class? Because you brought in just a bunch of the stars and and you didn't even bother really recruiting with high school. Do you have the top portal class because you brought in a bunch of young players like Florida brought in Jameer Grimsley and that helped their ranking with the portal, even though he's really a high school kid, things like that. I think everything needs context. Uh, I think that it can be sustainable, but you have to be really good at evaluating the portal, bringing in the talent that you need and actually using them properly. And I think that's a, that's a very important part of it. So I will say that if you are the kind of fan, kind of college football fan that follows recruiting and you go, Florida had the 13th ranked class last year, that's unacceptable. I think you need to kind of open up. I think you need to be a little bit more open-minded there. I think you need to open up a little bit because Florida also had the fifth ranked transfer portal class. And when you go with the composite plus the transfer portal class, Florida had the seventh overall class in the country for 2024. Georgia was first with 319 points. Alabama was second, 317. Ohio State's third with 309. Oregon was fourth with 302. Texas was fifth with 300. Miami was sixth with 299. And then Florida was seventh with 288 points. That's what it was. Florida also had less commits than Georgia, Alabama, uh, Miami, and Oregon. The only two teams above Florida there were Ohio State and Texas that had less commits that were high ranked. That's it. So I think that you really need to look at this completely. Alabama had 44 commits. And also one of the reasons that they're so high is that they had so many people leave when Nick Saban left that they had to bring in so many guys. They had 44 commits. Second highest overall class. You have to consider both high school and transfer. I think if you go, hey, you need to have a top 10 high school class this year, I think that's fair, honestly. I I think most people said recruiting class, and I think most people meant high school class. I think that's fair. Right now, you're nowhere close to that. And then, of course, you also bring up the the question, whatever you may call it, the question, the doubt, the concern, whatever you want to call it, of, well, if you have six wins, let's say, and a top six recruiting class is that good enough to keep you if you have seven wins but a fifth but the 15th ranked recruiting class or 14th ranked recruiting class we'll go to the opposite side do you keep them still i think there's a lot of it in context which is why i asked what's the combination and this was the combination seven wins top 10 recruiting class i'm going to say total recruiting class at the time uh but again that's i feel like it's also saying hey top 10 high school class at the end of the regular season I feel like that has to be the expectation because at the end of the regular season, if you've got the wins, or like let's say you have exactly seven wins, 
if you don't have the recruiting class, do you still cut bait and say, Hey, you're not recruit, you're not recruiting well enough, whatever it may be. I, I think that there's a lot of context that needs to go into this. It's incredibly exciting to just, just talk about, honestly, uh, I love hearing about it, but thanks for making lockdown gators your first listen of the day. Uh, I understand we can talk about all these hypotheticals, but Hey, in all kinds of weather, right? It's great to be a Florida Gator fan, Florida Gator, if you're a student, athlete, whatever it may be. Fantastic time to be a Florida Gator fan. We're about a month and a half away from the season kicking off. I'm excited. Thanks for making Lockdown Gators your first listen of the day. Every day, we are available daily and free. Reviews in the podcast and on YouTube. We'll be back. Something tells me we'll be back Sunday. Just want to throw that one out there. Something tells me we'll be back Sunday, not Monday. For Lockdown Gators, I'm Brandon Olson. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter at WNS underscore Brandon. Find all my written work with Giants Country and NFL 33, and I will see you all next time.